everyone. Welcome to the Turn by Turn podcast. I am Daniel, joined as always by Chris for something different. What is that? Well, we'll tell you. We are going to this season be interviewing indie dev game creators. And this week we are talking with Matt, whose game video game Fables is going to be coming out pretty soon. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing all right. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, my name is Matt Sharp. Um, I'm from Delaware, been born and raised here. I'm basically surrounded by farms, mostly chicken farms. So you wouldn't expect to find a developer tucked away in here somewhere. <laughs> but here I am somehow, right? Um, I work a part-time job with my brother doing programming work just to pay the bills. Otherwise, I am the typical poor indie developer that's struggling. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just live modestly, just make enough to pay my bills, working part-time. Otherwise, working full-time on this game. Um, I'm a dog dad. I have a beautiful little dog named Phoenix. Um, I have an associate's degree that I've never used. Uh, <laughs> I've been a gamer since I was like three years old, never stopped gaming since then. My parents told me I would hold the controller, playing Super Mario Brothers with my little hands, barely grasping on the controller. I actually started game development when I was pretty young, around like, uh, I would say like 10, 11, 12 years old. Uh, I had a collection of SNES ROMs and found one called Dante RPG Maker. Um, it was all in Japanese, and you can imagine no keyboard, no mouse, using a controller, and it's in Japanese, but it was like, I, I saw and I was messing around. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You can like make games and it's not super hard, right? From there, I pretty much found other art versions of RPG Maker, uh, just worked on them for a long time. I don't know how far do you want me to go with this. <laughs> I don't want to give you my whole biography, but like you know. as, as far as you want to go. But no, basically, I've been doing game development since I was a kid. I've been gaming since I was a kid. So this is it's in my blood, you know. Um, I've had various odd jobs. Uh, the last real job I had, full-time job, was I taught game development at a university for about four and a half years. So that was really, really cool. I, I love that, but then I just decided to come work with my brother. Otherwise, I loved it. I love teaching. That's something I also love to do. I just don't have as much time for it anymore. Uh, okay. So what, what sparked video game legends? What was the spark that you were like, I got to make this? Uh Video game fables, I guess. <laughs> oh, sorry, video game fables. That's cool. I'm, that'll be the sequel's name. That's cool. Um, <laughs> Ooh, sequel. Confirmed yeah, right? first. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was one of those things where, just to give you a brief history of like the other stuff I've made, I've made like a lot of terrible little unfinished RPG maker games. When I was around, I would say like 17, 18, I released my first like full complete game. It was called Lucid Awakening. Um, and that was made in RPG maker. It never like reached outside the RPG Maker community, but it did pretty well like in that community. It was just like a niche audience, pretty much. Um, I eventually made a sequel called Lucid Awakening 2, and that game like holds a really special place in my heart because that was my first Steam game. It was my first commercial game. You know, it was it was like my first real game, I guess you'd say. You know, it never got too much fame, but all the reviews are really good for it. The very few that are there, um, it's got like a really cool uh, what I call dual soul battle system. And this is something you can look up more if you want to look at the game on Steam and check it out and just look at the trailers. It kind of explains the systems. But I've always been interested in like cool battle systems and job systems and all that and RPGs in general. Um, I made a game called QB Sphere on iOS and Android. That was more of an experiment for me to break into Unity. It was also an experiment for me to kind of like work with iOS and Android. I always like to try something new and kind of broaden my horizon and see what else I can do pretty much. Um, but after all that, when I was teaching, uh, like I said, I, I was teaching for four and a half years, and I always want to have a project going on. And I had this game in my head for a long time. I mean, this, this was, I would say, six, seven years ago I had this idea in my head. And it started drastically different. It started as like a, I, I just had the thought, like, what if I made an open world RPG that was 8-bit, right? And then it evolved to more like, okay, what if it had more of a linear narrative? And then it was kind of a mix of 8-bit and 3D worlds. And it just evolved over time. Um, until I actually started developing it. And even when I actually started development, it still kind of evolved, you know, bit by bit. And the problem was, it was really hard with me working so much at the school teaching. I would come home and I was exhausted and I just never got much work done on the game. That was one of the reasons I came to work for my brother when I could have more flexible time and I could like have that time to really focus on this game, pretty much work full time on it. Um, but I pretty much just wanted to make something that was very lighthearted 
because Lucid Awakening 2, it's, you know, it's not like super dark or anything, but it's a serious narrative. It's a serious JRPG narrative. And I just wanted to make something fun, something to make people laugh, something that's really just kind of lighthearted, inspired by stuff like Paper Mario, Undertale, Earthbound, just something just fun to play and not super serious and bogged down. That's uh, one of the things that stuck out about this game. And we'll, we have footage uh, so the listeners can see like all about your game while we're talking um, was that if like I couldn't necessarily call it like it is like Chrono Trigger or it is like like Golden Sun mm-hmm. or like now that you're saying Earthbound, I kind of feel stupid for not having thought of it. <laughs> it does kind of feel like Earthbound, but. I was thinking like, well, it's kind of like Minecraft, but like it's like Minecraft meets the movie Mega Mind, <laughs> in like kind of like the coolest ways possible. Which is why you were the very first person that I reached out to you because I was just like, what am I looking at right now, <laughs> and like how can I get more of it? Do you want to um, give everybody just the like the elevator pitch of the game or like the the two minute summary kind of idea? Yeah, I mean the kind of elevator pitch like the thing i put on steam little blurb i put out it's that's a lighthearted, funny rpg about an rpg world that hasn't had a player in decades and that's kind of the basic plot of the game pretty much it's got a really cool turn-based battle system i try to have a lot of unique twists on that uh the main one is the crit system which i don't know if you're showing on screen now probably um and i can talk about that more later if you want um And there's a lot of cool stuff, like the boss fights. There's always something new going on. There's always something fresh going on. Like, it's a turn-based RPG at its core. For example, one of the bosses I was working on this week, you have things happening in real time where enemies are coming towards your characters, and you got to switch between the RPG battle that's going on and then also, like, a third-person shooter where you're stopping these enemies from getting to your characters that are hitting them in real time and taking damage. Um, There's another one where you, uh, once you kind of figure out the trick in the fight, it breaks you into a platforming segment where you have to jump up on these platforms to hit a button that'll knock the boss down so he's actually vulnerable to attacks. Like, there's always something going on, um, even though it is a turn-based RPG at its core. So that sounds really... awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Another thing that really stuck out was uh, the characters. So there's a princess, there's an NPC that thinks he's a superhero, and then there's, like, an unspecified, like, alligator man. <laughs> Yeah, so the the characters are a very crucial part of the game. Um, Like I said, the world is a traditional RPG world, essentially, that hasn't had a player in a long time. So you're coming along as a player, so they're trying to start up their script that they have. Um, So the thing about this game is it doesn't rely too much on satire and parody. Uh, I don't want to, like, I don't like to talk bad about other games, but I feel like a lot of times with, like, satire parody games or RPGs, it's like, they kind of rely too heavily on that as a crutch. And it's kind of like you have the joke of, okay, a hero saves a princess from a villain, but then there's no punchline. It's just that's the game. It's like the satire is we're playing through a traditional RPG, but there's no like punchline to it. So what I wanted to do with this game is there is that underlying layer of a very cliche RPG, but you're not playing that RPG. That Basically what happens, that script gets completely screwed up. Um... So they're trying to do something else to kind of get things back to normal and get their world back to normal. So you have this underlying layer of like satire and parody, but that's not the game that you're playing. And like a good example of that is you see dungeons that you would go to if you were playing the actual RPG storyline. Like there's a part where you see a desert uh, temple and you don't actually ever go in the desert temple. You go into the boss's house which is a birdcage up in the sky, right? There's one where you see a swamp temple in this, like, poisonous swamp. You don't ever go in there. You can just see it in the distance. You actually go into the boss's house, kind of again, and it's this uh, old uh, spider queen. You have to help her babysit her kids or her (laughs) grandkids, you know? So it's like there's this underlying layer of satire and parody, but I never wanted to rely on that. Like, the game is its own game. It has its own thing, you know? Mm-hmm. You you definitely have a good grasp of what players are used to because in your demo, uh, which I played right before this, um, the very number one first thing I tried to do was I was like, oh, there's a desert temple off in the background. I should go oh, so there. Saw- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you saw there's that birdcage in the sky. That's the actual like dungeon you go to. 
Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I'll have to revisit that. Yeah. Um, and another thing is you see age in the world, which I think is kind of a cool, unique thing about this. So a good example would be there was one of the guardians of these five keys that, you're, that you would be getting if you were doing the original storyline or the original script. Um, there's this dragon who has like a sapphire horde, right? Um, and he's just a very traditional dragon. You know, he has a gold diamond sapphire horde or whatever. Um, but you're seeing this stuff decades later when these people are getting, these characters are getting older. They're a little out of shape. They're not like, they haven't been doing this for decades, so they don't really know what they're doing, right? So this dragon, uh, he's actually become a hoarder. Like he had a dragon's hoard, and now he's just a hoarder, and his, his cave is full of junk. Um, I love it. <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, the Spider Queen, she was this, you know, Black Widow Spider Queen character, but now she's a grandma and she has a bunch of grandkids and you're helping her babysit her grandkids. Um, there's a this this bird who was like this really buff, strong uh, bird boss of the Desert Temple, and now he's super out of shape. And he's super, he can barely even walk. He's just so out of shape. So it's you see age in this world. Like you're seeing what can become of an RPG world when it sits idle for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question. Yeah. It can be hard to switch between like, uh, I t I, I, before this, I told you I'm a writer as well. It can be hard to switch from doing these serious plots to making jokes and having the punchlines land. Mm -hmm. Um, do you write comedy outside of this? Like, are, uh, you know, I just think I'm generally a hilarious person, so I guess that's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't like write. I don't really write anything. I don't write comedy. It's just like I don't know. I've always. My parents always told me I was always trying to make people laugh since I was a kid. I was always a ham, always a goofball, always a clown. So, I guess it kind of worked in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that really comes out in the next thing I sort of wanted to get into. The the fighting movements aren't necessarily what you'd think they'd be. Because just scrolling through some of the footage, um, there's a character that seems to open a bed and breakfast as an attack. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's a lot of really interesting like battle things that you don't normally see in games as like their attacks, and I just thought that was so cool. Oh, yeah. Can I say my my favorite one? Yeah. Uh, playing Gator. Gator was my favorite character, or Tater. Sorry. Tater, yeah. Uh, that that's his name, right? Yeah, his father's name is Gator, so don't get yeah. him. He'll be very offended by that. <laughs> yes, Respect so, the lineage. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite attack, though, is the one where he summons the giant statue of his dad, oh. <laughs> and the flavor text you gave it was like, crush an enemy with a father's disappointment. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I don't know how much you want me to go into like the combat and stuff, but um, I don't know, do you want me to talk about that for a little bit? Uh, yeah, if you want to get into some of the like more unique elements of it, go right ahead. Yeah, so uh, the core of the battle system, like I said, it is a turn-based RPG. It's very similar to something you'd see with maybe Final Fantasy X, how you have like a timeline, right? And you have turns. Um, in this game, though, each turn is basically a column, and you can stack turns on top of that, so they happen from top to bottom. So you'll get all the turns from top to bottom, and then you'll go to the next turn, go from top to bottom. Um, you can actually choose to delay your attacks a little bit, which doesn't seem useful at first, but you can actually use that to kind of like line stuff up with buffs, for example. Like if you have a character casting a buff on you and you want your attack to line up with that, you can kind of delay it over and kind of move that over in the turn order a little bit. Um, the other main core of the battle system that's unique is the crit system. And I, I guess, uh, Chris, you probably got to mess with that a little bit. Yes. Um, Danny, you might have seen that. Mm -hmm. So essentially... In normal RPGs, when you get a crit, what it does is it immediately affects the attack that got the crit. Like, it'll, like, double the damage you do or something like that. Um, in this game, however, when you get a crit from a basic attack, it stores it in a little red box next to that character's uh, HP gauge. So what you do is you, you use that crit whenever you want. You can kind of store up a crit, and you can choose to use it later on whenever you want. Um, so the core kind of loop of the battle system is you use basic attacks to fish for crits. And then once you have a crit, you use that crit on a skill. And it's balanced in a sense that crits don't affect basic attacks very much. So you're incentivized to use them on skills. So if you were just like spam skills, they're not going to do that much damage. Um, you need to use crits on them. So it kind of sets a balance where you can't just spam skills, but you also can't just spam basic attacks. 
and basic attacks have as much value as a skill does. Whereas in a lot of RPGs, it's just like spam the strongest skill you have and that's it, essentially. So this kind of incentivizes you to switch it up. Um, it also gives you that little uh, sense of joy, that little like a little bit of RNG in there where it's like, oh, cool, I got a crit. Now I can use this really strong skill and maybe finish off an enemy with that. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the core loop of the battle system that makes it pretty unique. And I, I like that as a balancing uh, mechanic. I noticed that there wasn't mana management. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a, somewhat a replacement for that because there's no mana. Um, there's no penalty really for using a skill. It's just it's not going to be strong unless you use it with a crit. Um, and talking about some of the skill animations, too, uh, the, the, the main three characters, throughout the whole game, it's just three characters. There's no extra party members. Um, you have Aru. She's the princess who basically let herself out of the prison. And that's actually what caused this cascade of events that messed up the entire script and caused this story to start. Um, she doesn't want to be a princess. She hates this stuff. She really thinks it's stupid. Uh, but like I said, she's the one that ends up causing this catastrophe to happen where the castle gets taken, her father gets taken, the villain gets taken. That's kind of the core of the story. So she she did an oopsie, and that kind of messed up the whole thing. Um, Nate, he's an NPC who wants to be a hero. And you can think of him as kind of like a comic book nerd. Like he's obsessed with these past heroes in the cycles. Um, he's just obsessed with this stuff. So he, uh, a lot of his skills are NPC based. So you were mentioning like opens up a bed and breakfast. Like he has a skill that puts an enemy to sleep and it's called innkeeper. And essentially what happens is a counter drops down, a little in sign drops down in front of it. And he just does a little bit of like dialogue or whatever, puts the enemy to sleep, right? So a lot of his skills are like NPC based. Um, some of his skills are kind of based on his love for heroes in this RPG. Like he loves the RPG aspect of the world he lives in. So like he has a wind magic attack that is he summons a model airship and it's basically like, don't tell Square Enix, but it's basically modeled off like the Final Fantasy one airship comes down, shoots a ball of air at the enemies and flies away. Um, he has like a pickaxe ability where he picks a pickaxe with a big rock on them. So he has like these NPC kind of things. Um, Aru's skills are kind of like princess based in a sense. She has like the traditional like heart stuff for healing. She has a throne stomp where she jumps up in the air, sits on a throne and squishes the enemy, right? Um, Tater, he's the villain's son. He's like the villain in training. Um, he has a lot of like villainous things, like kind of dark stuff. Like you said, one of them, it's based on his relationship with his father, where he summons the weight of a father's disappointment. It's a statue of his father comes out of the ground and crushes the enemy, right? Um, another thing is each character is pretty equal. Like no one's like the caster, no one's the healer, no one's the attacker. They all have the same exact stats. And some of them will be a little better at some things just based on their skills, but they basically have different flavors of some of the same things. Like, they all have a heal. Like, one, Aru's heal is just a straight heal. Nate's heal is a regen. Um, Tater's heal is basically like a Final Fantasy blood weapon where he puts a status effect on you, and when you attack, you get healed from the attacks. So a lot of them have different flavors of the same stuff. They're not necessarily caster, healer, support, whatever. Um, they also each have one physical skill, and they also each have two magic skills, and the elements are kind of divided up. So Aru has ice and lightning, Nate has earth and wind, Tater has uh, fire and water. Awesome. So I think by now, definitely Chris and I are on board. So, um, and I bet a lot of other people are too, actually. So um, any like anticipated release date for this? Oh, God. I, <laughs> that's such a hard question, because, like, when it's done is what I'll say. Uh, mm -hmm. Off the record. That, that's a good answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to get it out by the end of the year. The Steam page says Q4 2021. Um, I'm not going to promise that, but that's, like, my goal, and I'm pushing really hard for that. I'm working really hard every day trying to get that out. Um, but it'll be out when it's done. Awesome. So uh, do you have any specific platforms you're aiming to release on? Yeah. So first I'm doing Steam because that's kind of like the easiest platform to work with. You just I don't know if you guys know much about the process. You just pretty much pay like a one time fee for your game. It's like 100 bucks and then you just upload it pretty much and they take a 30 percent cut of sales. It's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. Um, so Steam is going to be first. Um, 
I'll probably try to do maybe Epic Game Store after that because that's still just PC. Um, shouldn't be too hard to work with just to get more of an audience. I really, really want to do Switch. That's like, I don't want to say 100%, but it's like 99% I'm going to do Switch. Um, but that's kind of a little more expensive because when you develop for a console, which I've never done before, so the Switch version could be like five years off from now. Don't <laughs> I don't want to make any promises. But uh, essentially what you do when you develop for a console, you have to get in contact with you know Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo. You have to get a developer kit, which can usually be pretty expensive, anywhere between like 500 and 2500 bucks. Um, and you have to like we'll kind of work closely back and forth with them and like optimizing for a console, especially one that's a little weaker, like the Switch. Uh, it's going to be a process, but I 100% want to do it for Switch after I get a little revenue in from the Steam and Epic Games version. And then maybe after that, if that's doing well, I'll do like PlayStation and Xbox as well. And then and we get our sequel, Legends. <laughs> yes, video game Legends. <laughs> and I'll do the Mac version just for you, Daniel, uh, 10 years Ooh. from now, probably. For, for those who don't know, I am saddled with just a MacBook Pro at the moment, which is certainly nothing to complain about, but it makes it very hard to play <laughs> PC games. Yes, very much. But so we're going to leave all your social stuff in in like the the description of the episode. But um, what is the best way for people to like reach out and engage with you, support you, help help you get this done? Yeah, so... Um... I guess the first thing is I would I would probably want you to go to linktree.com slash video game fables. I don't know if you're familiar with Linktree. It's basically you can just have a very simple page where it just has like a bunch of links, whatever you want on there. So if you go to my Linktree, that's linktree.com slash video game fables, you can see all the links that we'll talk about here just in one place. Um, so that would be like the first place you should go. Um, you could also go to my website, momijistudios.net slash video game fables. Um, uh, I do frequent updates on Twitter. I have a Discord. I'd love for you more people to join my Discord and just chat and kind of be part of the process there. If you, like I said, if you want frequent updates, definitely follow my Twitter and join the Discord. Um, but generally, if you want to support me and you want to see this succeed, the very first thing I would tell you to do is wish list it on Steam. That helps like the Steam algorithm start showing it to more people with those same interests. So that would be the first thing if you want to support this. Go to Steam, hit that wish list button. That's the first thing. Um, the second most important thing you could do would be join the Discord and follow me on Twitter just to kind of get some interaction and you can kind of follow and be part of the process. Um, I would say probably the most important thing is just to share it. Um, I don't think people really understand how valuable and important and crucial word of mouth is for solo developers like me who have zero budget. I mean, I can't afford a marketing budget. Um, it is so important to share with your friends. Like, you know, you, you see these big AAA games, you don't usually share it with your friends because they know about it, right? So I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in that mindset, like share indie games with people. They don't have a budget, help us, <laughs> we're struggling. <laughs> so yeah, share it with your friends, um, like share videos and clips and stuff on social media frequently. Uh, tell your friends in person, like your nerd friends, tell them about the game. Um, if you're in discord groups, like you're in some nerdy discords, share the game on there, talk about it, really just talk about it with people. Just that's, that's the most important thing I, I could ask you for. If you like this, if you want to support me and help me get this out, talk about it with people, share it with people. Uh, does downloading the demo help that algorithm at all? Um, I'm not sure, but probably. So that's probably a really good suggestion too. And yeah, I should have mentioned that too. Just play the demo and see if you actually it's something you're interested in, because you can actually experience it. And that is on Steam. Just make sure you wish list, wish list it as well. That's my one condition. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, maybe when this game is finally released, we'll have to do like a full full fledged episode on it. And if you're willing, get you back on. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, and we thank you so much for coming on um, and being sort of the guinea pig of our new interview <laughs> series that we're trying out here. Um, and just so much thanks to you for being willing to do this with us. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. This is a wonderful honor. My first podcast. I love this. I love being with you guys and experiencing this with you. It's really cool. All right. Well, I guess that wraps us up for our first episode of interviews. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And... Uh, I always butcher it, but let me try to do our socials. Um, you can find us at the Turn by Turn Pod on Twitter. You can find us at the Turn by Turn Podcast on Instagram. 
Uh, if you could rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate that too. And we're also on YouTube at the Turn by Turn Podcast. And so, that has added value this time because we have video for this. Yes, uh, these interview episodes are going to have video elements on the page highlighting the different games. So you'll definitely want to check us out on YouTube this time around. And so thank you, everybody. And we'll you'll be hearing from us next week. Bye. Bye. See ya.